Wonderful, and uh, I guess good evening everyone, and thank you all for staying out so late. Um, my name is Yan, I've been using AWS for quite a while now, it's been uh, coming to almost 10 years, which is uh, pretty scary. As Paul mentioned, um, I'm working for a company called The Zone, where I'm a uh, principal engineer. We have offices in both London as well as in Catarist, and of course I'm here because uh, we're hiring, so the company is quite happy to, to send me here to, to, to propagate a message. Um, unfortunately, I've only been at the zone for about a week, so that's not a lot of interesting production experience I can share with you in regards to what we are actually doing. But before the zone, I worked for a company called Yubble, which is, you can think of as a social network that is a mix of Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. And it was there that I learned a lot about AWS Lambda and how to operate it in production. So when I joined Yubble about 2016, April, this is pretty much what we had, a few monolithic systems, so written in Node.js, running on EC2 instances. And being an early age uh, social network, we didn't have that many users. So the baseline traffic is very low, but we did manage to grab a few influencers from other platforms like Instagram and YouTube and so on. And Emily was one of our top users, even in the, even at that stage, she had about 50,000 followers. And like many other sort of celebrities in these social networks, she would run the campaigns on our platform where she would say, hey guys, come and vote on my post and uh, at 10 o'clock I'm going to announce a lucky winner for this beautiful designer handbag. So I think you know what's going to come. <laughs> right? Baseline traffic is very low, nothing's happening, and then at exactly 10 o'clock when she's about to announce the winner, bam! <laughs> So you get this uh, nasty spike of traffic, some, oftentimes a uh, hundred times your baseline, which as engineers is really difficult to provision resources for. And to make matters worse, because um, we had all these random spikes during the day that we can't control, it's not predictable, so we tend to run our EC2 clusters at a very low utilization level. And we also want to have to scale up earlier, quickly, so that we can meet any demands that we have when we see one of these spikes, so we tend to scale up a lot earlier as well. On EC2, typically you see people scale up around 70% CPU, but we are doing it around 40-45%, which when you put the two together, it means that we are throwing a lot of money at AWS for resources that we are paying for, but not using. And it gets even worse, because at that moment in time, deployment was taking up to 30 minutes and required downtime. So when we do a deployment, the whole system goes down for 30 minutes, nothing happens when you go to the app, there's not even error message or maintenance screen, you just see a buffer screen and like, nothing's happening. <laughs> and that, is, uh, that obviously is not good enough for these days. And um, one of my favorite speakers, Dan North, once said that the lead time to someone saying thank you is the only reputational metric that matters to us. And of course, to get that thank you for good work you're doing, you have to first deliver some value to somebody. And that means for us as, as, uh, as engineers, it means we have to ship our code and make sure that it's running in production. So I know that I inherited something that's not good and we clearly have to do something better, but before we know we can know how to do that, we have to define what good actually looks like for us as a company and as a team. So I sat down with the team and we came up with a list of criteria that we want for deployment. We want them to be small, to be fast, no downtime, and we don't want to be in a situation where we have to do lockstep deployment with the client team because of the sheer amount of coordination and stress involved. And we want features to be loosely coupled through messaging and uh, every feature should be independently deployable. And from the infrastructure point of view, we want to cut out all the fat that we had in our AWS bill, and there was plenty of it. We were easily paying, uh, I don't know, 95% over more than what we actually use. So utilization is probably around 5%, which clearly not good enough. And we also want to minimize the amount of uh, operational effort that we have to take on to monitor the system, to, or to scale things, or in, in some cases, uh, which I think is ridiculous. As an engineer, uh, I'm not a professional babysitter for EC2 instances. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, the infrastructure should just work, and it should just work for me rather than the other way around. And also, we want to reduce the technical mess that we inherited, and that is a very conscious choice of wording. You hear a lot of people talk about technical debt, but for something to be a debt, it implies that at some point someone's made a conscious decision to trade off some, uh, to trade off some long-term com complexity for short-term gain with a plan to pay it back later. That's how debt works. What we inherited was just really bad work, unfortunately. And whilst we fixed all this problem that we had, we don't want to just take six months out and not deliver anything. And if anything, we wanted to deliver more value to our customers quicker than we've ever done before. 
And if you just fast forward just a few months uh, with a very small team of six people, we arrive at an architecture that is both event-driven as well as service-oriented, with Lambda being a centerpiece that glues everything together. At that point, we had about 170 Lambda functions running in production with many more in development. And we were paying for Lambda about 5% of what we were paying for EC2 for a comparable amount of compute resources. And, but more importantly for me though, we went from doing maybe four to six deployments to production a month to easily doing 80 to 100 without having to hire a whole army of developers. We just made sure that everyone can be more productive by using the right tools. Of course, from the moment we realized that Lambda is a good fit for the direction that we want to move towards as a team to actually having that first function running in production, we had answered a whole bunch of questions. It's easy to just find something shiny and then just chuck into production and hope for the best. But as developers, as professionals, we, are answer, we have the answer to our stakeholders and we have the answer to our users. So we have to make sure that whatever we put into production, we can actually manage, to, we can actually manage them and run them responsibly. And that means we have to answer questions around how do you do continuous delivery with serverless? What about testing, logging, monitoring, and so on? And personally, I love Lambda, but ultimately it's still just a tool. As we change the tools that we use to build and run software with, oftentimes you find that the patterns and the practices that have evolved with previous paradigms, they have to either be adapted or they have to change entirely. But the underlying principles behind those practices and patterns still very much apply. So uh, principles such as uh, sim a single responsibility, loose coupling, high cohesion, and so on, they still very much apply when you move to serverless. And as our architecture expanded to include more and more services, we had answered even more questions around how are we going to do distributed tracing in this world? And what about config management and security? We get to the devils a bit later, but for now, I just want to have a, you know, give you a quick overview of some of the things that we were able to deliver very quickly. So when I joined the team, we did have a search feature, um, but it was, uh, it was implemented as one big regex against the MongoDB and clearly it's not going to scale well. In fact, we were running into performance issues uh, even with about 100,000 uh, users, which is, you know, as a social network that's got aspiration to become, to have tens and hundreds of millions of users, that's clearly not good enough. And it was also very difficult to do anything beyond rudimentary ranking as well. You, you couldn't easily do ranking based on, say, how many uh, shared connections you have with that particular user or how prominent that user is, is currently in the platform. So as part of our migration to serverless, one of the first things we did was to make sure that all the state changes in the system, in the legacy system, are now published as events into Kinesis so that we can have a Lambda function process those events. And in the case when someone creates a profile or someone updates their profile, we will update a corresponding document in the Amazon Cloud Search, which is just uh, hosted the solar. And to make that into something that you can actually use, we put an API in front of that using API Gateway and Lambda, so that now you've got a search API that you can easily use to search users by first name, last name, and username, and so on. At the time, we also didn't have a BI capability as such, and so we went about building it from scratch. In this case, since uh, we already have a legacy system publishing events into Kinesis, so it's really easy to just have another Lambda function attached and subscribe to those Kinesis streams. And then in this case, we'll live stream them directly to Google BigQuery, which is a platform that I've used for many years and have very good experience with. So this work took many iterations. The first iteration took one developer just two days from having that first discussion to something running in production. And at the time, we just had a new BI guy join us, and he came to us afterwards and said, Jesus, guys, nothing ever got done this fast as Skype. I uh, hope there's no one from Skype here. <laughs> but obviously, there's no, there's, no, there's no disrespect to Skype, but it goes back to the point that the lead time to someone saying thank you is the, is, is the metric that we're trying to optimize towards. And as we became more confident in terms of how we operate and run Lambda functions, we started to tackle other more important parts of the system like uh, Twitter or Facebook, you, we have a timeline feature which works exactly the same thing. You follow people and their posts will show up on your timeline. Um, the only difference is that our implementation was so bad, it, it fails all of our QA tests. There's a very clear set of documentation in terms of how it should work, but when the QA teams came to test it, everything fails. 
And it was so bad that when the new CTO came in, he basically fired everybody that was involved with the previous system. Uh, so we also didn't have other people that was you know, that built the system in the first place to go back to as to why do you guys make these decisions? It doesn't make any sense. So instead, we went back to the product team, sit down with them, understand how the feature is actually supposed to work. And we went about building it from scratch by, well, from the ground up, by again, consuming events from the Lexus system. So in this case, whenever you follow someone, those are published into Kinesis as the event. Same as whenever you uh, create a new post, you, you like someone else's post or you unlike them. And these events are then handled by a number of uh, Lambda functions. In the case of me creating a new post, a Lambda function will, will react to that event and you'll find out who my followers are and then batch them into groups of say, I think a thousand. And for each of those batches, send a message to SNS, which will then trigger another Lambda function who will then process that event and uh, add your post to your followers feed, which in this case is stored as a sorted set in Redis. And the reason why we go past, uh, we, go through, we proxy through SNS is that we can leverage the retry behavior you get out of the box between SNS and Lambda, whereby anything fails, say when you're talking to, uh, to Redis, then you get two retries out of the box and then delete the queue as well if you uh, configure that. And that's so that we avoid doing the expensive part of the computation, which is figuring out how, who your followers are. For someone with, uh, I don't know, five followers, it doesn't really matter, but imagine like Twitter, you're going to have a few percentage of people that has got a large number of followers. So you want to optimize towards the, the worst case scenario where you don't want to have you know, a popular user creating a post and it crashes your system. And again, once we've got this information in Redis, we can put an API in front of that using uh, API Gateway and Lambda. And uh, to, to allow us to deliver to our customers uh, earlier without having to wait for the, pro uh, the client teams to catch up, we will also as part of our sort of graceful migration uh, plan, we will also proxy the Lexus system endpoint to go straight to the new API so that straight away when we're able to improve the system by rebuilding it with, uh, uh, I guess, new technology, we can deliver value to our customers straight away without having to wait for the client teams to catch up. And uh, like pretty much any other social network, we have a feature to suggest you people you should follow. Uh, interesting thing is that uh, our implementation just return the first 30 people from a database by account creation time that you don't follow already, uh, which by and large just return people that the uh, employees of Yubo, which is great for me because I've probably got a few followers from that. But for anyone using the app, it's probably not what you actually want. So at this point, we are streaming pretty much all of the state changes into Kinesis and then into Lambda and to Google BigQuery. So all the things that happen in the system is available in Google BigQuery. And Google BigQuery is a system whereby you can, you can run arbitrarily complex queries and still get response back within a few seconds or tens of seconds. So we created a cron job, which is a CloudWatch uh, a schedule that calls Lambda, which runs a query against uh, Google BigQuery and applies the time decay formulas that, based on the, that scores, scores your trendiness based on how many people followed you in the last hour, two hours, four hours, and so on, and how many people liked your post. And then we save those trending users into DynamoDB and put an API in front of that. At the same time, whenever you follow someone or unfollow someone, those relationship changes are also processed as events uh, through Kinesis and Lambda and save into and use to update a social graph in GrapheneDB, which is a hosted version of Neo4j, a graph database. Nowadays, if we do it again, I can probably use the, uh, Amazon's new graph database, Nat, uh, Neptune. Again, that means we can now create API in front of that to allow you to easily query and look for people that are your second or third degree connections. So that is people that follow the people that follow you or the people that are followed by the people that you follow and so on. And once again, once we have all the new systems working, uh, we can then we just update the Lexus system endpoint to uh, instead of returning the first 30 people from the MongoDB, you will call these two new APIs and then combine the results together and straight away overnight we were able to deliver you know, a, useful a useful feature to our customers. So that's just some of the exa some examples of things that we were able to deliver very quickly again with a very small team. And for the rest of the talk I'm going to focus on some of the things you need to think about in terms of how you're going to get ready for production with Lambda. I guess the most important lesson I should, uh, I should tell you is that 
try to use one of the try and tested uh, deployment frameworks out there rather than writing your own. And this is the pitfall that this mistake I made myself, whereby you think, yeah, Lambda is so easy, you can write a deployment framework yourself with a few lines of code, but there's a lot of nuances to actually how it works, making sure cloud formation stack is uh, set up correctly, how you do per function policies, and, and so on and so forth. And that's why we ended up using serverless framework, and we still use it today. It's probably the most widely adopted one around, and it also has got a very powerful plugin system that allows you to extend it if you ever run into problems with the framework itself. There's also Amazon's, Amazon's uh, SAM framework, or Apex, or ARP, or Cloudia, or Zappa, Sparta, etc., etc. You get the idea that as uh, symptomatic of anything that's new and shiny, there's a new framework for it pretty much every single week. Rather than getting drawn into all this noise and spending all your time trying to find out what is the best framework, I think you should just you know, try a few, decide what's, what's best for you, for you and your team, and then just mandate it on a team so that you can maximize knowledge sharing inside a team whilst minimize the amount of friction people have when they move from one project to another. How you deploy your software should be consistent across all of your projects rather than every time someone goes to a new project, they have to learn how do I deploy your, my Lambda function with this framework when I have been using some other framework previously. And as you start writing your Lambda functions, you need to make sure how, you need to work out how you're going to deploy, sorry, how you're going to test them as well. And as far as testing is concerned, this is still my favorite book written by two Londoners. Uh, it's a bit, I guess, dated now. It came out in the late 90s. And this is the first time I've, uh, you know, the first book where I find that it actually mentions what we call the test pyramid now, where you've got your unit test. If you've got some business logic that you can encapsulate into a small module, an object, you can still write unit tests against them the same way that you've always done. And then there's integration tests where you test your code against code that you can't change. And since Lambda ultimately is just one tiny bit of function, a bit of code, the Amazon calls on your behalf when some event happens. So there's nothing that stops you from calling, invoking the same logic locally with a stub event and context object. The thing to remember here is that because these tests are testing against uh, the purpose of this test is to test your code against code that you can't change. So I would advise against using mocks or stubs, except for those uh, error con uh, error cases that's really hard to replicate. So for the happy path, you should just talk to the downstream system directly. We we'll talk more about that later. And then you have uh, once your system's been deployed, you can run your acceptance test where you test the whole thing end to end. And as you go up and down this triangle, um, unit tests are going to give you a much faster feedback loop that we enjoy as developers. But in terms of having confidence that what you're actually working on is going to work when you deploy it, you're going to get far better confidence from your acceptance test that actually tests the thing that's been deployed. And one of the key lessons I learned from this book, and I'm just going to read it because it's quite long, is that we shouldn't mock types that we can't change because we find that tests that mock external libraries often need to be complex to get the code into the right state for the functionality we need to exercise. The mess in this test is telling us that the design is not right, but instead of fixing the problem by improving the code, we have to carry the extra complexity in both the code and the test. And the second reason is that we have to make sure the behavior that we stub or mock matches what the external library will actually do. And even if we get it right once, we have to make sure that our tests remain valid when we upgrade those libraries. And I think the same principles apply in this increasingly service-oriented world that we live in, whereby we depend on so many external services that we don't control and they can change without a notice. And I think fundamentally, you have to think about serverless, um, testing serverless differently because your risk profile is different. And if you focus your testing effort on what goes on inside the function, and you just mark or stop all of your external dependencies, then you're going to miss out most of the things that can actually go wrong when your function runs in production. Personally, for me, when I create a new function that talks to, say, DynamoDB, the first thing that goes wrong when it's deployed is that uh, I forgot to give you permission to talk to DynamoDB table that I've just created. Okay, that's painful that I you know, fix it, I redeploy, and run it again. The second thing that goes wrong is that the table is not there because I have forgotten, you know, I haven't included the table as part of my resources so that uh, when I continuously, did, um, uh, de uh, continuously deploy my function to my integration uh, environment, those resources are not being created. And this problem with configuration or this risk of uh, misconfiguration and management is just going get, to get worse the more functions you create. And trust me, with Lambda, you're going to get a lot of these functions. 
And one observation I made through my time working with Lambda is that your code becomes far simpler. There's far less things for you to worry about. Um, parallelism is now managed by the platform. And in terms of uh, you know, framework, you don't have uh, you don't have to use those uh, complex web frameworks anymore. You can write things very simple. And because every function, if you keep them single uh, sing, uh, single purpose and simple, there's only so much complexity you can squeeze into one function. That oftentimes, that you know, the code that I have to write is not is very little. The risk of something actually being broken has now largely largely shifted to how my code interacts with the outside world. And since the whole purpose of us writing any code at all is so that we can ship something working, we can ship working software to our users, and I think that is the goal that we should, opt that we should optimize towards, and that's how we use it to organize how we work. So even if it means we have to sacrifice some of our feedback loop that we enjoy so much, learning the wrong thing, getting false positives, is not going to help us deliver working software faster. So for that, I would say you should definitely focus more on, on, on having integration tests than the unit tests with uh, mocks and stubs. Another thing I learned from the book is that um, where the guys talk about how wherever possible, an acceptance test should exercise the system end-to-end -end without calling directly into its internal code. And end-to-end -end tests interact with the system only from the outside through its interfaces. So if you go back to the search API example I gave you earlier, to actually test this system, we will interact with the legacy system through its HTTP interface, the same way that our client application would. In this case, when uh, we will talk to the legacy system through so uh, HTTP to create a new user, and then we validate that after all the background processing, we are able to search for the new user we have created by first name, last name, and username by talking to the search API. <coughs> so. When you run an integration test, uh, you're running your code locally and talking to the real downstream system that you're depending on. But once your code is deployed, you are running your test cases against uh, ultimately the same code, but through API Gateway. So the only difference between your integration test and uh, acceptance test is how your Lambda function is invoked. So we leverage that fact and, so th and allow us to re reuse our test cases, whereby in our test cases, we will define a when step and inside the definition of that when step, we have a simple toggle that looks at uh, some environment variable. If it says handler, then you will call the function locally. So that would be your integration uh, uh, um, test case. And we can use the same test case for acceptance test case uh, for acceptance testing, whereby we have a different uh, environment variable set up, uh, and uh, uh, and then our test would our when step would call the HTTP endpoint that's been deployed. So now you've got your automated tests uh, sorted out. You now need to think about how you're going to do continuous delivery. And there's oftentimes I find that when you're working on a new project, there's a tendency to leave continuous uh, uh, CRCD pipeline to the end of the project. And I'll argue that since these are pipelines that helps you save you to help save you time as well as save you from human error, you should consider them a lot earlier. And going back to the same book, the guys talked about how we prefer to have the end-to-end -end test exercise both the system and the process by which it is built and deployed. It sounds like a lot of effort because it is, but it has to be done repeatedly anyway during the software's lifetime. And that brings me to one of the things that really annoys me, whereby you have all those, uh, your build steps that are captured as custom scripts on Jenkins box and not source control. So inevitably at some point, someone's gonna break it and then your build process is gonna be broken and you have no idea who changed it, when, and uh, what was said before so they can quickly roll back. So for that reason, for all the projects that we had, we have a convention whereby there's a very simple build script in every single project that is just a thin layer on top of what you get with NPM as well as the service framework and allows you to have a simple DSL for running unit tests, integration tests, deployment, and then run the acceptance test thereafter. And if you look inside this script, there's really nothing to it, but just NPM install and then use the service framework to do the deployment in this case. What's interesting though, is that we install the service framework as a dev dependency to the project. And the reason why we do that is so that you can mitigate any problem you have in terms of version conflicts with the service framework itself. And this is a hard lesson that we learned when the service framework was 0.5x, and then when they migrate, when they create a new uh, breaking change, everything broken uh, when they launched the 1.x. 
So we had this problem whereby you have to have compatible versions for a particular project. So the conclusion we reached in the, for that was just have the serverless framework itself installed as a dev dependency. So essentially, you tie your project to the version of a serverless framework that it was uh, developed with. And it's as for CI, uh, the actual CI tool you use, there are just so many of, of them available in the market. It really doesn't matter what you use. I think what's important though is that you should apply the same thinking that the hexagonal architectures have in terms of your core domain should be captured and independent from the ways in which it should be exposed to the outside world. So having a simple script, capturing all of your build steps for your continuous integration and the continuous delivery allows you to do that. And also, be, since it's just a simple script, it means that you can also run it locally as well as the same way that you run on a CI box which makes the debugging a lot easier as well. And in terms of uh, continuous delivery versus the deployment, we were doing continuous delivery and we're using Git flow as well. So as soon as something is merged after pull requests and review and whatnot, gets merged into master, we trigger a deployment which we run the unit test and then integration test, and then we deploy to a dev environment where we then run the acceptance test. And then once everything passes, it goes on to the next environment and the next environment just before production where to deploy to production is a single button click in Jenkins for someone to do. And the reason why we do that is because we don't want to deploy on Fridays. And uh, like many other staffs uh, in London, we have uh, Fridays uh, drinks in, on Friday afternoon. So we don't want to be deploying something and go to drinks and realize everything's broken, right? And once your code is running in production, you need to make sure you can actually manage, you can you know, get, uh, okay all of your logs. And for Lambda, whenever you write to stand that out, Whatever you write, it gets captured by the Lambda service and shipped to CloudWatch logs asynchronously. So this doesn't add any latency to your function's invocation. And you also get additional things such as the UTC timestamp as well as a unique request ID. But the problem with CloudWatch logs is that uh, you can't easily search for anything. You, can, you certainly can't search for things across multiple log groups in CloudWatch logs. So typically what people do is uh, they will go to CloudWatch logs console select a log group for your lambda function and just stream it to another lambda function and from then on you ship it to whatever log aggregation service that you're using. One thing to keep in mind though is that every time you create a new lambda function the service will automatically create a new log group for you which means that now you have to have someone going in to click a button subscribe a new log group to your log shipping function and you don't want to introduce a human, uh, um, human step into, into the process what you could do is enable CloudTrail, which then allows you to create event patterns in CloudWatch. In this case, um, I'm matching against the, pat uh, the, the API called create log group, which the system makes in order to create a new log group for me whenever I create a new function. And I say, whenever that happens, call another Lambda function whose sole purpose is to subscribe this new log group that's been created and subscribe it to my log shipping function. So this happens every time automatically whenever a new function has been created. You don't have to do it manually either. You can have uh, something like this in your serverless or YAML if you're using a serverless framework. So as soon as you deploy your functions that does the sort of log management, you can get that out of the box. Another thing to keep in mind is that CloudWatch logs by default is uh, set to never expire, which doesn't make any sense because you're paying for them or a monthly month, uh, month from, uh, uh, every month. And Especially if you're going to be shipping all of your logs to somewhere else anyway, why keep them forever and paying for them in the CloudWatch logs? Especially with GDPR just around the corner, this can have additional implications as well if you're keeping logs uh, forever. So you can use the same technique, uh, enable CloudTrail, CloudWatch event uh, pattern against create log group API call, have another Lambda function whose job is to update that retention policy to something more reasonable like seven days. So you've got all of your logs um, in one place, uh, the searchable, that's all great. Uh, but when it comes to something more complicated, you still need a bit more help. In the case of you creating new posts and it gets processed by all this background event processing and they ended up in someone else's uh, stream when they come into the app, a lot of things have to happen. A lot of functions have to work in, in the perfect uh, synchrony for that to happen. So what if someone comes along and say, hey, I posted something that uh, my followers didn't get my post, what's up with that? In terms of investigating where the problem is, you can look at individual logs for all the different functions, but you still need some way to sort of get a chronological order, of, uh, a chronological view of everything that happened in relation to that particular post. And that's where 
correlation comes in for um, microservices whereby you can capture user ID, uh, the original request ID that created the post or the post ID itself and pass them along to every single place where you're processing that data. And since, <clears throat> and since processing is uh, happening through APIs, uh, through Kinesis events, through SNS, that means your correlation IDs have to get propagated across all of those different event sources. And the way we approached it was to create a custom HTTP client and uh, as well as uh, <coughs> wrapping the AWS DK client as well so that we can easily capture incoming correlation IDs and then forward them on. With HTTP, it's kind of easy. You put them into the HTTP headers, and that's quite a standard way to do things. With SNS, you can also attach them as a message attribute whenever you publish a message. And with Kinesis, there's no easy way to do them. There's no obvious place to attach them. <coughs> so what we did was uh, we have a convention whereby correlation IDs is recorded as part of the payload that we send to Kinesis uh, with a name like underscore underscore context. So we make sure that all of our all the correlation IDs we capture ends up in all of our logs so that we can easily search for everything related to a particular user, to a particular post, or to a particular request ID. But you still need uh, something else to help you understand the performances. That's where X-Ray comes in, which is a service that Amazon provides that allows you to see the trace of what happens inside your function, especially if you take the time to instrument your code. So in this case, you can see at the top there how long the entire invocation took, as including how much time was uh, used to initialize the function and how much time the function itself took and all the different steps when, it's, uh, when my function was talking to DynamoDB, to S3, to SNS, and so on. And you also get a service map view of the same traces that X-Ray has ca captured for you. The one, big downfall, uh, the, the one big problem with X-Ray is that at the moment, it doesn't support API Gateway. So if you look at this down here, in this line is where my API, my first function is making a call to a second function via API Gateway. And uh, when it talks through in the function through API Gateway, you don't see what happens inside the second function. It's recorded as a second trace that you can't link them together easily. But if you call another function directly via the Lambda API, uh, Lambda's API, then you do get a trace because uh, funny enough, X-Ray supports Lambda but not API Gateway. Even though I know the X-Ray team is actively working on this, at a, well, at a, as this right now, that's not available. So you do see how much time it took from the first function's perspective, but you don't know what are the difference or breakdowns for what happens inside that second function. And in terms of monitoring and alerting, one of the things that we also lose as well with Lambda um, and I like guess service in general is that we now lose access to the underlying infrastructure that runs our code unless you're talking about something like Kubeless or OpenWiz, where you still run the infrastructure themselves. That means so there's nowhere for us to install monitoring demons and agents, and we have to rely more on what you get with uh, CloudWatch, which does give you the basic telemetry around your functions, invocation count, error count, latency, and so on. And other providers also start to support the Lambda, and uh, what they mostly do is they grab the state they use the same data points you get in CloudWatch, but give you a better looking dashboard in front of it. The IO pipe guys, however, are doing something slightly different in that they give you SDK where you can use to wrap your function code around so that they can intercept function invocations and when it finishes and then record metrics to their own system. And you can get additional data points uh, from your function, including how much the CPU was being used, how much memory was used, whether or not the invocation was a cold start and so on. The problem with the approach they have taken is that now that you lose the ability to do background processing, so anything your function has to do has to be done inside the function's invocation itself, and that includes talking to any third-party system to record the custom metrics or traces and so on. And when you're talking about something like API Gateway, a synchronous invocation, API Gateway doesn't respond until your function finishes executing completely, even after you call the callback function, whilst your function is still doing other stuff, the API Gateway is not going to see your function as finishing, and uh, that means your user who's made the API call has now waited for you to fin your function to finish sending custom metrics and whatnot, and that means you have a longer latency. It may think that's going to add, what, 10, 20 milliseconds, which is not a big deal. On its own, that's true. But when you have microservices, it's quite common for you for single user action to require several API calls. So those, on average, 10, 20 milliseconds, can now to start to compound. 
And it's quite easy for you to start adding maybe more than 100 milliseconds to the user-facing latency, which is the important thing here. As Amazon found out a few years ago, that every 100 milliseconds you add to the user-facing latency can actually have an impact on the, the, the cells you make as well. <coughs> so this problem with uh, not having any background processing is uh, kind of painful. One of the few ways you can do, one of the few ways you can sort of work around this problem is by piggyback off the background processing you, you do get, including collecting metric, uh, collecting logs from cloud uh, from your standard out to cloudwatch logs. So one of the things you could do, and this is how Datadog supports custom metrics, by the way, and something that you can apply yourself is by recording custom metrics that you want to record for application level metrics as uh, specially formatted log messages. And in your function, that's processing logs and shipping them to your uh, log stack, um, L stack or logs IO or logly or whatnot. You can identify those and then send them as custom metrics to your monitoring system instead, which could be Datadog, it could be CloudWatch. And once you've got all of your metrics in one place, don't forget to set up dashboards, uh, create alarms. And that, you remember that, that example we saw earlier in terms of using uh, uh, CloudWatch events and Cloud and uh, CloudTrail um, and uh, API calls captured by CloudTrail to call some other function? You can actually automate a lot of the dashboards and alarm creation using that as well. Because ultimately, whenever you deploy a new API, for example, you may want to automatically create uh, alarms around the 95 and 99 percentile latency for individual endpoints. And you don't want to be doing that by hand. You also want to create custom you know, dashboards for a basic set of things like error count and whatnot. What you could also do is create those automatically by hooking into the create deployment API call that uh, Lambda, well, that the, your deployment process will make to deploy the API in the API gateway, and then call another function whose purpose is to create those custom those alarms for you and the create those dashboards for you as well. And finally, let's talk about uh, conflict management. And uh, from my experience, at least, the, the, main, the, the most important thing to consider is that your approach allows you to easily and quickly propagate any conflict changes you make. Nowadays, when you create a new Lambda function, you can add the UI as your change as well. You can, use, uh, you can declare environment variables. You can also have a KMS encrypt them for you as well. The problem with this approach is that it becomes really hard for you to share configuration values across multiple functions. And even if you're using serverless framework where you can have multiple functions all configured in the same file, so you can share within the same project, but then you still can't share config values across multiple projects. And this became really painful when you have, uh, say, um, some API that many, many services have to talk to or share database credentials or API keys and whatnot. Whenever those things change, you have now go and deploy all of these functions that are impacted. Another thing we found was that uh, with environment variables expecting a deployment time, which means you can't separate one's ability to do deployment to, a, uh, to an environment to one's ability to access those secrets. Which for a startup, it doesn't matter. I mean, for, uh, for us at Yabo, um, everyone has access to everything anyway, but for large enterprises, oftentimes you have uh, legal requirements to make sure that production secrets are not accessible to I don't know to everyone, to, and only available to a few handful of people. But at the same time, you don't want to you don't want to stop people from being able to do deployments themselves and to add friction into the process. So what we arrived at was to use some sort of a centralized config service. And for that, at the time, I looked at console, I looked at SCD, and to be honest, I didn't fancy either of them because it now brings me back to having to manage and run servers. In fact, a whole cluster of them for uh, for high availability. There's also a lot of um, learning curve involved in terms of how to set up and configure the service and how to use the, CI, the CLI tools and whatnot. So at the time, this was uh, 2016, we wrote a very simple config API ourselves using tools that we already know by this point using API Gateway and Lambda. And funny enough, later in the year, Amazon announced the SSM parameter store, which basically does all of that for you and more. And more recently, they also announced a new service called the Secrets Manager, which also have a built-in support for rolling uh, sorry for rotating secrets as well. So in terms of two-lane space, uh, two-lane this particular space is definitely getting richer inside Amazon uh, Web Services. Uh, the key thing to remember here is that uh, you want to make sure all these uh, sensitive data you have are encrypted both in flight as well as at rest, and that you should have a role-based access to all the secrets. In this case, with uh, parameter store, at least uh, you can have your admin person who's got access to those secrets, store them in the parameter store. 
and make sure that it's encrypted. So it's uh, encrypted by KMS at rest. And when your function boots up, the first thing you do is uh, if you need some configuration, you talk to parameter store, which is just an API call that happens over HTTPS. So you also encrypt it in flight. And since you're going to likely be doing this for a lot of different functions, uh, probably all of your functions, it's worth the while to invest into uh, having a ro really robust client library that can fetch config values at start and then just cache them and then have some way to periodically refresh the cache or using weak signals, such as uh, if you're using it to, config, uh, to store where your APIs are that you need to talk to and you start to get file streets or something else or 404, um, then maybe it's time to, refer, you know, to fetch the config value again. Maybe the URL for the service has changed and your, third, your function now is uh, holding on to stale config. I guess the last thing, I guess as a, as a, as a conclusion, I will say that DevOps uh, is something still very much relevant to you when you're using serverless, even though, because DevOps is nothing about, it's not about containers, it's not about EC2, it's a set of principles that, that wants to reduce the time between you committing some code to it running in production in, with high quality. And at the start of this whole serverless thing, a lot of people are talking about no ops, which obviously got a lot of attention. A lot of people got really angry. Um, but, um, but ultimately, ops is something, it's, it's, it's not a set of act, act, uh, actions, it's a set of responsibility that you have to your customers. If your system is down, your customers are gonna, it's not going to blame Amazon. They're going to blame you, <laughs> that's for sure. So what I would say is that serverless op is different. The tools that you used before may not be fit for purpose anymore. And uh, you're going to run into all kinds of problems if you're trying to just squeeze existing tools onto a different paradigm. But the underlying principles behind those, uh, be be behind in the service world, you see very much the same, where you, you need to be able to monitor things, you need to be able to see what goes wrong, in, uh, what's going on in your functions, and you need to have continuous delivery as well. A lot of things I've been talking about today um, has been also been put together into a video course I'm producing for Manning. Um, feel free to, to check it out. And uh, yeah, thank you very much uh, for sticking around and listening to my listening to me talk. I don't know if we've got probably no time for questions. I'm not sure. Okay, just well, hit sure. So the app became more scalable and more uh, responsive, uh, mostly because with, uh, with, with EC2, it takes about uh, 10 minutes to get a new instance um, running. So when we get those massive spikes, we just couldn't get instance behind load balancer and start serving requests fast enough. With Lambda, it scales automatically. So unless, so you, you do get some, uh, some lim hard limits. So there's a hard limit for 500 containers per minute, but so long you're not getting like a thousand requests uh, within the say first, uh, uh, say 100 milliseconds, then Lambda is able to catch up as soon as uh, scale faster than the, the, than the request is coming in. So the app became more responsive as a result and more scalable. In terms of financial wise, uh, we found the Lambda function invocations themselves to be, a very small, um, to, to be very small by comparison to other things we're using. So Kinesis, for example, once you have a few shards, a few streams, uh, the cost for Kinesis and other things that you use around your Lambda functions becomes more expensive than Lambda. But even then, we still found that it's uh, far less compared to what we were paying for EC2 because of how low you know, utilization we were using and we have to keep all this uh, spare capacity around for those uh, uh, unpredictable spikes. Another interesting thing you find with Lambda is that because it's based on per invocation, you can actually find out what functions cost you most money so they can focus your refactoring effort and optimization effort on things that's actually, once you optimize, can have a financial impact. Um, so yeah. This thing uh, in terms of financially uh, is uh, is is, uh, is a pretty big game changer. Was there another question? Yep. Yep. <coughs> yep. So. It's ultimately, you, when, you, when you build a service architecture, you're building a microservice architecture. So you apply the same sort of, you know, I guess, same principles, same pro approaches there, whereby one service would be in one repo. So therefore, it becomes one service. So YAML file, so you know, everything inside that particular API, for example, would be inside, would be one serverless uh, project. 
and they'll be, uh, they'll be deployed together. That means when I want to work on something, I just go to one repo. Everything I need to know about that particular sub subdomain will be inside that one particular repo, and when they be all they be all deployed together. So when for all the functions you are seeing, there will be I, I don't know how many projects that we had uh, will be in the sort of I don't know twenty or something projects. Mm -hmm. That's no service uh, discovery built-in. We use a uh, simple config and a uh, naming convention. So for, say, the public API, uh, uh, so for user API, for example, we know there's a, con a convention for how, how it's named. And uh, for the environment, it'd be something like user API dev dot whatever. So that's all in the, uh, that's all in the Roof 53. And we create those resources as part of our deployment processes. And uh, we also have, uh, after that, we have them in the config, uh, in the parameter store as well. So when a service boots up, it gets from all the uh, config uh, parameter store all the config values, including where's the user API I need to talk to, what's the API key I should use to talk to the uh, 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 API gateway or well, whatever. So those that we just use uh, our config services to sort of manage that. Mm -hmm. Uh, you, we cache ourselves, but that just means that you put it into a global variable, uh, well, into a local variable that you, because uh, um, your, because your, because your containers get reused, right? So you don't have to call every single time when your, when the containers get reused, you still have whatever that you had in memory at that from the previous location. Okay. Yep. Uh, only if you over if you if overload the parameter store, uh, which we didn't manage to, maybe potentially it could be. Oh yeah, so in terms of time, it does add to your cost of time, uh, and uh, depending on how many parameters you're fetching, uh, we find that you probably add to maybe about forty or so uh, milliseconds if you're adding if you're fetching I don't know a, a small handful, half a dozen of uh, uh, config values. That's all we know, JS. So. We won't see in very high uh, cost of time. With Node.js, we typically see somewhere around uh, maybe 300 or so milliseconds uh, cold start. And we didn't have, we make sure that our functions also very light as well. Didn't have too many dependencies. Um, with uh, Java or something else, you're gonna see cold start time around three to seven, uh, seven seconds. And that's the same with, uh, with .NET Core as well. I think .NET Core is getting better, uh, but still it's, uh, is Donald Core, uh, Donald Core version 2 is a, is a bit better, but it's still sort of in the sort of same ballpark. With uh, Python, uh, Go, and Node.js, uh, those three are pretty good in terms of uh, COSAR time. And also, as far as COSAR is concerned, the uh, Lambda is way better compared to Azure functions and Google Cloud functions. <laughs> so until I tried the other ones, I didn't realize how good I had it when I'd been complaining about 20 millisecond COSAR time. <laughs> Three to seven seconds for JVM. It's unacceptable, and that's why when in my previous company, um, after Yabo, I worked for Games Company, and we're using Lambda, but we also Scala because it's a Scala shop. Uh, no one wanted to touch Node.js, uh, so we didn't use Lambda for APIs. We only use Lambda for uh, events processing. So using Kinesis, where you know, you add ten seconds to your background processing, it's not ideal, but no one really notices. Sorry. We use that a lot for monitoring metrics. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, but what do you think about Prometheus, Grafana, and so on, open source code? Uh, sure, feel free to use them. I wanted to get away from having to manage any infrastructure as I possibly can. So Datadog or any sort of managed services is my preference. Because again, remember this is a small team. Now at the zone, we have a big team, so, it's the, so the, the, the equation is different. But for a small team, I want to use the only managed services. I don't want to run any server, get away as far from that as possible. So Grafana, yes, maybe I think you do have a host of Grafana, which I use at one point. Uh, but things like Datadog or even CloudWatch itself, 
is uh, pretty straightforward to eat and also it's all managed for me. So that would be my preference, at least uh, for that particular company, because of the number of people we had and uh, you know, how much easier it is to just work with managed services. Okay, just uh, sorry, what's that? Uh, every lambda is, is uh, yes. Every lambda function is a separate uh, is a, is a separate uh, separate module in the yeah separate uh, JavaScript module. Yeah, so the, uh, I see a lot of people they uh, I've seen I've seen like, a lot of cases where uh, there's still a bit of a like, I guess debate in the community in terms of whether or not one API should be one lambda function or one endpoint should be one lambda function. Where I stand on this is that you should follow the single responsibility principle for a number of reasons. Uh, for starters, when you have uh, multiple functions, one for each endpoint, when you look at, say, your, your, your Lambda dashboard, you can see, okay, for a particular feature, maybe by name prefix or using tags, I can search for user API, I can see five functions, each, I can straight away know that for this API, I've got these capabilities, I can find user, I can, I can add user, I can delete user, I can do this or, or whatnot. But when it's just one function, I have no idea what it actually can do. I know there's a function that handles API, but what can it do? I mean, that information of that function being there is almost useless to me. And also, in terms of being able to identify where I should start optimizing things, if uh, everything is just handled by one function from that, uh, that endpoint, maybe one of the endpoints is a lot more expensive and, than others. I have no idea because from the billing wise, I can't tell. It's just one function, how much it costs you. But if it's in individual functions, then all of a sudden I can see, okay, the delete endpoint is, is a, a lot more expensive. Uh, you know, why is that? And then I can start focusing my effort in terms of uh, you know, optimizing things that's going to have a, a business impact in terms of revenue. Uh, so that's, and also with uh, security, with individual functions, you can give them individual permissions, uh, so uh, IEM roles that limits them to exactly the things that they need. Whereas uh, if everything is being handled by a single function, that means that function needs to have the permission for the entire, all the things you have, you can do with the API, which means again, it's a big uh, attack surface. Um, you know, it's, 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 uh, I guess security is also quite interesting as well that uh, I can probably spend the next 30 minutes talking about and I can't because I've got a plane to catch. Uh, but certainly it's, uh, it's those are the three things uh, that makes me choose, uh, always choose the single response, uh, sort of single function doing, doing one thing. Okay. Yes. So we uh, so we found if we found part of our unit test integration test that we use the we just call a function code locally. So using something like uh, Mocha, you can uh, you can just run your test and then uh, uh, invoke the function code locally because it's ultimately just a bit of function I call it with the event and the context. So I can call it I can test it that way to actually sort of locally run and debug it with the serverless framework. You also can use the command to uh, invoke local I think, and so I can use the Visual Studio code attached to the debugger to Node.js, uh, so to uh, the debugger to the serverless uh, framework runtime, and then run the command so that I can locally debug the code locally as well. And uh, as if, I, if I, often what I'll do is uh, when there's an error in the production, I will always log the invocation event so that I can capture that in my log and then, then try to run it locally and see, okay, you know, what's, what, 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 uh, what is going on. There's a lot of other things you can do around logging in terms of uh, uh, one of the things I've been keep, you know, keep telling people about is uh, using structured logging, so that when you're logging from uh, from uh, from Lambda, don't just write to you know console.log, you know write a proper JSON object, so that it becomes easier to then add things that you're going to need for correlation IDs and other things. But also disable debug logging for production, but sample it instead. So one of the things I keep finding myself is uh, okay, there's some bug in production. I know I've got the logs for it, but it's debug logs, so I have don't have any of it in production. Whereas uh, if I just have like maybe one percent of my debug logs, then at least I always have some things that I can I can find from production and help me debug things. And when you got microservices, you know you're capturing correlation IDs and passing them on anyway. What you could also do in that case is make the decision to sample debug logs at the edge, the first service that got hit, and say, okay, one out of a uh, one out of a thousand requests, we're going to enable debug logging, and we're going to pass the decision along. So all the other things that's, uh, that has, that's capturing and the recording the same correlation IDs also knows, should I enable debug logging for this particular invocation? So those are things that uh, you should consider doing as well, uh, which I find really useful as things get more complicated. Uh, but yeah, what was the question again? <laughs> right, yeah, that's right. 
How do we get on the logging? <laughs> uh, uh, but yeah, logging, uh, uh, testing serverless uh, framework kind of helps you with that, and also with the, so you know, when you write your test, you can just run locally as well. Cool, all right, if uh, there's no more questions, uh, feel free to get in touch with me via you know, those places, and uh, you know, nice talking to you guys.